Because life is not rosy, welcome to Life in Violet, a feminist option for social change. Life in Violet, to build up empowerment for women and girls, a better and safer society for all. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new emission of Life in Violet. As you know, my name is Veronica Pereira Carrillo, and I welcome everybody who is listening to us on our Facebook site of Life in Violet, because this is broadcast through there and my personal Facebook profile. And uh, well, please have a look at our previous broadcasts. You can find them in our YouTube channel. You'll find uh, that we have already spoken about women and religion in Spanish on the 14th of June, and it was really brilliant. Those who have the option of translating or who understand Spanish, you are most welcome to listen to a brilliant emission, really brilliant panelists as well. Uh, before going into our topic, uh, let's remember that today is the International Gay Pride Day. Of course, we only speak about women's rights, but we as feminists, we have solidarity to LGBT rights as long as they don't erase women's rights, of course, and especially what is understood by the term woman. Let me share you our special solidarity to the LGB Alliance. And here you have the LGB Alliance addressing this gentleman belongs to the LGB Alliance. And he addresses the committee about the gender recognition reform bill and the dangers it, it poses for same-sex attracted people. It's important that we press for every opportunity to represent LGBT people in matters of legislation and public policy that affect us all. And they say, we were delighted that our application to be a witness at the Gender Recognition Reform Bill Committee in the Scottish Parliament was successful. And our head of research, Malcolm Clark, read the statement and answered questions from the panel. He argued that prioritizing sex over gender would mean that people who are same-sex attracted would no longer be able to protect their sex-based ba rights. Uh, he was particularly concerned that lowering the age for receipt of a gender recognition certificate to 16 would mean that younger teenagers, many of whom were coming to terms with their same-sex attraction, would rush towards this milestone. He shared the panel with women's rights groups whose concerns, and this is our mandate, of course, about poor legislation and its impact on sex-based right echoed our own says the LGB Alliance. The second announcement says about the census that uh, occurred in Argentina in this month. Uh, they say we were right when we warned that if we cannot specify the category of women policies related to sexual discrimination, against women which are protected by the conventional legal framework of the CEDAW would be altered by the infiltration of personal perceptions unrelated to sex. For, instance, for example, policies related to health, education, and healthcare would be altered by the infiltration, I, I said, of personal perceptions unrelated to sex, such as policies related to gynecological health, breast cancer, uterine cancer, etc. Without a doubt, we were right. 
continuous the campaign, when we said that it was necessary and important that transgender people be clearly visible and accounted for in order to satisfy their needs. And counted for to satisfy their demands for recognition and justice, and that at the same time, gathering accurate data on sex was essential and of vital importance for women and girls. As Argentine women and citizens, we regret to note that we were right. And today we are left with the sole remedy of denouncing of the waste of public money because of the census, time and efforts in the census that proves to be a useless instrument to measure in material and objective terms the experiences and needs of women and girls. Yeah, and also the experiences and needs of the population to the point of not being able to effectively quantify the exact number of women and men for the design of public health, educational, etc. policies. In the face of the consummated facts, we call to reflect on the interest that the state has through several governmental instances to not confuse sex and gender with a specific plan that normalizes sexist stereotypes, that's important, and introduces non-scientific categories to define men and women. In other words, said the campaign to empty the biological reality of its content while hiding the patriarchal oppression to which women are subjected. And this was signed in Buenos Aires on, in June this year. And the contact is Mujeres en Campana, everything together, at gmail.com. We would like to express our solidarity with the gay collective that was so cowardly attacked in Oslo two days ago. This, of course, has to do with religion and we'll try to deal with it a little bit in our panel today. And of course, our condolences and our claim not to happen ever again, such a terrible attack on human beings. And bad news to finish this introduction, and it's the 50 years drawback in women's right that represent the overturning of Roe versus Wade in the US, which means that half of US population are not in control of their bodies and it's the legislators and the judicial system who can direct what women can do with their bodies. That is really regrettable. And our solidarity with the U.S. women who are, have begun to prepare the resistance. And uh, now I would like to introduce the topic today, which is women and religion. Uh, please let me say hello to our two panelists today, which is Cristina Moreira, who is the first a woman priest in, uh, in Spain. We'll talk about that later. Hello, Cristina. Such a pleasure to have you here to receive your, your contribution about women, Catholic women priests. Thank you. Such a pleasure for me too. <laughs> I'm feeling honored to be here with you, sharing that uh, panel with other sisters and brothers. Excellent. We have to thank you twice as much because it's almost midnight in, in Spain. A generous act from you. And of course, a huge hug to Dasha Vasini Rodriguez, who is a PhD in education, and she's a Buddhist. Dharma Charini. <laughs> And a wonderful friend of mine for a long, long time. It's been one of the treasures and one, one of the gifts of my life, your friendship, Dasha Vasini. Welcome again to Life in Violet. Thank you, Ero. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here during this panel. 
Thank you, Christina, to be here too. Hi. Hi. Um, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you too. Before going to our panel itself, let me tell you a little bit about the other religions, uh, because we have the Christian religion, the Buddhist religion, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, Judaism. It was really an incredible surprise for me to know that women have been allowed to the rabbinate for really a long, long time. And uh, here we have the rabbi Regina Jonas, who was, as we can see here, ordained in 1935. Unfortunately, she was executed, well, murdered in Auschwitz in 1944. She was not allowed to have full functions as a rabbi, but she led the way to women studying to become rabbis. And it was in uh, 1972 with uh, Sally Present, who was ordained, fully ordained as a rabbi. And uh, she was the first American woman rabbi, of course. From that ordination, there was uh, a lobby which was organized especially to promote women's ordination in 1972. Two years passed and the second rabbi was uh, ordained and uh, she was a Sandy Sasso. She was ordained in 1974 by the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College becoming the first Reconstructionist woman rabbi. And the first woman rabbi in Latin America was a Brazilian lady. And the first uh, rabbi in Argentina was Analia Borst. She was born in 1967. She's a medical doctor with postdoctoral studies in bioethics. And she became the first Argentinian Latin American rabbi. She was ordained in Jerusalem. And last time we spoke with Silvina Chemen, who is a rabbi to an incredibly brilliant and open-minded person. Please uh, look for her in uh, Facebook because her speeches are really very tolerant, very intelligent, and very constructing peace among religions. There is a documentary here in this uh, website, which is Jewish Women's Archives. We are talking about 50 years of women rabbis. And there is also a, a movie about Regina Jonas, and it's starred by Rachel Weiss. Oh yes, here is the first Latin American female rabbi, Fernanda Tomczynski Galanternik, who is a psychologist and the mother of one, the first Brazilian woman and the first Latin American woman to be uh, ordained. And she was ordained in the conservative com community in Sao Paulo in 2005. How about Christian women? We can begin with Antoinette Brown Blackwell. She was an itinerant preacher. She was born in 1895. And uh, she was a preacher until September uh, 1853. And she, when she was ordained minister of the congregational church in South Butler, New York. And then there was another woman in, 19, in 1866, Eleanor M. M. Davison, who was ordained a deacon in the Methodist Protestant Church. The first woman pastor was, in fact, Olympia Brown, as I told you, in 1869. 
So you see, a, it's incredible how, um, a, how a advanced, a, how early a Protestant a pastors and ministers and female ministers were ordained. Let me please have a, a show you a pause. Uh, sorry, there is a terribly loud uh, demonstration here in front of me. I don't know if you can hear it. No, well, good. Uh, let's listen to Kululam with the song Let's Get Loud. Kululam is an initiative, a choir initiative, uh, that in 2019 collaborated with uh, One in Nine, which is an NGO to mark internationally this month as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And 2,000 people gathered to sing and celebrate. Hagamos ruido, let's get loud. And now let's share a little bit and we go to our panelists and we introduce them as we should. So we were listening to, to Let's Get Loud uh, by Jennifer Lopez uh, in the cover of Kululam. And uh, now came the time of the panel. And as I said, we have two wonderful panelists. Dajavasini Rodriguez is a Pali name, meaning she who dwells in kindness. And I can tell you, I haven't seen a better, a better uh, name for a person. And uh, also the first uh, woman, deacon or priest uh, she will tell us Cristina Moreira let's go to our first question what's the role of women in your religion uh, let's begin with uh, Cristina if you want in your case of course the Roman Catholic Church Cristina so in my religion uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, this uh, institution gives very different roles to women and to men. In our tradition, we have seven sacraments or signs or rites, and women are just allowed to receive six, when in theory, every baptized person is child of God and child of church. The baptized does not allow the same function and the same kind of holy grace, which is what is received in sacrament. In fact, depending on if you are man or woman. In fact, more than spiritual issues, what matters now, today, and since a century in church, in Roman Catholic Church is canon law, where rights and duties are written. It's a sort of law corpus for the organization of the institution with very high level of detail, and we can easily detect that. The main spiritual, administrative, and either economical leadership in small communities and for whole Catholic Church in all scales is in men's hands because it depends on ordination, but seventh sacrament. So if, so if you want to have access to leadership or decision power or responsibilities, you need to be priest, so ordained, so impossible for women. Sometimes little powers are given to women, but it comes from an ordained, person, an ordained person, which is a man. 
Canon law does not speak so much about women as you can imagine, mainly as a woman religious or consecrated or as lay and married persons. The Roman Catholic Church is a very hierarchical institution where leadership and power belong to men and the woman needs permission to do everything. They must wait for a man to nominate them to a job or a change, even now with Pope Francisco. <laughs> Usually women are in charge of care, service and traditional and old-fashioned roles according to a discriminatory comprehension of their gender. The Gospels, the texts which we must read carefully if we are Christian and we must obey, are clearly equalitarian because Jesus himself paid equal attention to men and women. Mary, his mother, was reduced to a gentle and modest girl, not very interesting and very obedient, like a sort of slave when she is really, actually, a free woman, asking questions to God before to say yes. 